Billy, you seem to have completely mastered the fingerboard. What can you tell us about the shapes and the patterns you use to connect the neck up? Well, um, I doubt if mastered is the word, but... Uh, oh, it looks like it. ...stumbled upon uh, okay. some form of uh, understanding of it. Um, when I play a, a particular scale, like we touched on in the last video, um, I have certain patterns that I use, uh, like for a G major scale. For me, when I play, a, uh, again, to reiterate, when I play a, a pattern in one position, like for the in G major scale, like right there, I do all the notes that you can do in a G major scale in that position, which would also include this low F sharp, even though right. it isn't really part of that scale, I just, just because it's contained in there. And, it's a note that your finger can go to in that scale, exactly. so I do it. So, I, so actually, a G major scale for me then would be. Right. So I get them all in there. So now, another type of scale, the only other type of scale that I know of actually is a pentatonic scale. Well, wait a minute, though. You could get minor off the yeah. major. So. Yeah, because it's yeah. A, a major and minor I consider pretty much. And you're, you're pretty same. fluid with both sounds, major and minor, and you're playing. Well, that's, that's pretty much because they're both really the same thing. Right, so you can parlay just, that. Yeah, just as a G major scale. G is a minor. Exactly. Is a is an E minor, a form of the E minor uh, modes or scale. Right. Or you, you you help me out with this. So you things. have both facets of it and contained in that scale. Yeah, yeah. Now the pentatonic is kind of uh, major and minor free. It's mm -hmm. kind of it's kind of an Oriental. Right. So what it is, um, actually, when I when I uh, do it, I also. Uh, try to do it all the way across the neck. So right. we're doing two notes per string. Well, let me ask you, because it's uh, a five note scale, that's why we're limited to basically two notes in the positions as opposed to three. Good point. Actually, I forgot all about that, but you're totally right. So now if you take part of that pattern, put it together, this is G major chord. So if you're playing guitar and you had two extra strings there, a real G major chord. So um, now you know that is a pattern of a chord, and uh, it's made up of those component notes. Now, if you take the pattern that that chord makes, in this case, we'll move this finger up to there. Right. Even that sounds rather dissonant. It is. It's a non-resolved something right. or other. Well, it's uh, a G with A in the bass. Yeah, it's a G with A in the bass. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Needs resolution, though. You're right. Yeah, right. Uh, New Year's resolution. Anyway, um, <laughs> so there's a G major scale. Um, now, if I take the top notes of that pattern, here comes the bottom notes of the next, of the next uh -huh. position. Now here. So what exactly. I'm doing there is I'm trying to show the top note of each um, position of a pentatonic scale makes a pattern, right. which in itself is a chord, basically. Right, of some um, type. Yeah, uh, I, see, uh, uh, that I don't know the names of. It but could change depending yeah. on what's behind you, you know, harmonically. Yeah, so, okay, you, you, that, that's, that's your department, I guess. <laughs> okay. I'll just play it, you explain it. But uh, <laughs> uh, the song that uh, I did with... Mr. Big called Had Enough. Right. When I was learning the modes on guitar, the E minor mode, it actually formed a chord by the lower parts of it. And when I strummed that chord, and I actually did all of the chords made up of that uh, mode, it actually seemed to make a reasonable huh. facsimile of kind of a songy type of thing. Okay, well, let's see what that's like on the guitar, if you wouldn't mind demonstrating that. Yeah, uh, hand me that, uh, that little boy over there, and I'll see what we can do with it here. Um, anyway, uh, the idea when I was practicing guitar, learning a couple uh, uh, things to write some songs, and I write a lot on guitar, but uh, which sounds like an Almond Brothers song, doesn't it? It does, yeah. It has that country flavor to it. <laughs> anyway, um, so I noticed that, that that chord that that made was part of all those notes there, so it actually became... Yeah. It became part of the... So you derive those actually, chords from the mode. Right, so it's an E minor kind of mode. So so that fits all the... the any 
pattern. I always wonder how these jazz guys got these amazing uh -huh. chords all over the place because they understand scales so well. Exactly. That they can put uh, any configuration of notes together and come up with an amazo chord thing. So you see these jazz guys doing all these comping chord stuff, and you, I was wondering, how in the world do they ever learn all those chords? Well, they just basically know their stuff, and they know their scales, and they know their, their modes, and they know how to put them all together and lightning fast. And, and, uh, and that relates exactly to what you're talking about, connecting all the shapes. Right. So what I'm doing basically is just uh, like, so now if I take uh, uh, like a G major, pentatonic version. So I know if I'm in G. All those. It's all in G. So if I'm playing in the key of G, it's easy to find a spot to go to because you right. know that that's your spot. And then you just do variations, part of one, part of another. So now, do you visualize the note G somewhere in those shapes? Sometimes I do. Like, for example, um, G major. If I got that note in the middle, this is kind of the simple way I did it when I first started, uh -huh. but it actually still holds true to this day for me anyway. Um, uh, two whole steps here, whole, two whole steps here, and two whole steps on the string underneath. If that's your root, you know that if you got a string above it and below it, it's really ridiculously simple. But it, it helps you to get a start on the idea of having a pattern and having some place to go. So now, similarly, any of those notes, of those uh, nine notes, work with that. Various combinations can be created. Yeah. Basically, in the key, you can, of course, I'm stretching a point, and I don't understand it musically enough to really explain it in those terms, but I'm explaining it in pattern terms. Exactly. So now, once you know that that. There's your. Okay, so that pattern works up here. Or if you have enough fret. Well, what note is your reference note to? The one G the, there. The G. In uh huh. The, so now you know, anytime you have uh, a key anywhere, Again, ridiculously simplistic. If your key is like, you know, that, that, you know that if you're, if you're in a major. You know that, that, that your pattern around that is such. Of course, there's a million other patterns yeah. around it within the context of a major scale. But so all these the, things are movable and yeah. they remain symmetrical. They remain uh, relatively that, yeah. the same. Yeah. So if you have a particular note, and it's a major uh, scale, and it starts and it has that note there in it, you know that you've got all those notes around it yeah. that you can go to to play if you so desire. So it's really a matter of being selective then with the notes. Once you've accumulated a lot of them, you become selective with what you play yeah. out of those patterns. Exactly. So now instead of just doing it rote pattern thinking. Once you're used to moving in those patterns and you can kind of just step back and let that little machine you created with your hands kind of right. kind of direct it from like a remote control thing. Uh, like directing the machine, the analogy you made uh, speaking earlier about how you use scales. Yeah, um, basically you just create your, a hand that does all the moves and then you sit back and kind of with your little remote control like you would a little race car or something and make it make it work around that's pretty much how I play because yeah. I don't really think about the scales I'm doing I don't right. think about what's going on I'm just kind of uh, reaching into the cosmos or the ozone or, or whatever zone that it happens to be <laughs> and trying to find some uh, areas there that kind of relay what I'm feeling and thinking at the time or or you know on stage or in the studio whatever but to give you an idea um, all those notes that I played are those nine notes that work around this G, G included. If you're just... Are there some specific areas of movement that are better than others in connecting these shapes? Um, well, uh, you get used to certain moves with your hands. Like for a long time, for many years, that was my move. So whenever I was solo, if, you, if it was an E minor, which is the relative right. minor to G major. Right. Uh, so 
so I would really be stuck in that pattern for a long time. So I finally forced myself to break out of it <coughs> and make myself do a lot of other things. So the idea of it here, the, the, the final analysis of what I'm talking about is once you understand a shape, and you understand that from one note you've got all these moves you can go to, all these different notes, and you have one stable spot to find is that is your note. That's the key you're in. Now usually, like when I first started bass, it's like, okay, I got a G here. I, I know this move. Paul right. Samuel Smith and the Yardbirds. Exactly. Then we used to do an up, up an octave. It's like, oh, a whole different one. So you saw it for like two or three years of my playing, it goes. Just all in that one pattern. And then after a while, you learn to expand it more. And you have more patterns and more option notes to go from G. You can go to there, to there, 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 there. There's another one. There's another one. There's another one. So are these shapes you would commonly call on in improvising? Yeah, I guess in the beginning, when you're first starting to understand improvising, I guess you would, you would work with shapes. Right. Um, eventually, you get to the point where you're not thinking shapes. You're thinking music. You're not thinking what scale you're doing. You're thinking, I have an emotion, and here it is, through via the bass. Um, I look at... Uh, learning the shapes and learning all the spots on the neck to understand, uh, similar to in language, because music is in a way a language, uh, learning a little bit of vocabulary. So you get kind of a, it's a building block. Um, sure, when you're in school you got to learn spelling and vocabulary and sentence structure and it's a drag and you hate it. And that's what this kind of is. Learning sentence structure, similar to learning uh, the structure of the patterns. But once you know it, you can speak like we're speaking now. Right. And this is what music should be like. Communication. Just like I'm talking to you. Exactly. Where it's just effortless. I'm not thinking pattern. You know, let it, and let it fly. And all that comes uh, the fluidity of being able to just play something, Bill, play something, you know, just to play it, uh, comes from just, just years of learning uh, where, what in the world is going on in this space right here. It's a very small amount of space, but you have to understand the patterns and the tunings and uh, all the things that different emotions and major and minor will give you and everything like that. Once you know that, then it's, it becomes music again. So it's all contained in those sets of intervals that we'd spoken about, their orders, and finally the patterns, how they recur. Yeah, that's the technology of it. Right. In real life, you want to play it. Mm -hmm. So that's why uh, instructing or explaining, this is not real life. This you have is to just, absorb it and yeah, recreate with it. This is just the foundation. That you yeah. Do. tips for building strength and endurance in practice periods, particularly, you know, designed for stage use? Yeah, um, whenever you have a, a move that you're doing, you have to pull it apart piece by piece. Find the weak spot and just isolate that. Um, if, uh, like for me, for example, sometimes this finger lags behind the other ones. So I'll sit there and just do that finger. By itself? For a while by itself, and then in context with that one. And then all three then reverse, and then reverse that way, and just do, do with those two together, and then by itself, all different strings and every different combination, till you get that finger up to its normal strength again. So when you're having trouble, sometimes you gotta, it's really hard to pull a lick apart because it goes by real fast, you're not sure right. really what's wrong with it. So do it real slow, take it, uh, you know, like. How slow would you do it, for example, if you had um, to demonstrate that? Like. Uh, oh, you're doing a lick that's like. harder as well, push harder. Yeah, so you can kind of see which, because you, as you hear in there, there's a certain skip notes, I and mean, you really analyze it close, it's not quite right. When you're playing live a lot, a lot of stuff is blown by and you don't really notice it. And you can have a lot of inconsistencies in your playing that you're not aware of. So a lot of times just to stop, slow down, go sit in a dressing room or a quiet room and, and work it out and find the weak spot and pound on it. I guess it's basically, um, in order to prevent hurting yourself, and if you know a little bit about, I, I don't really know anything about bodybuilding, any kind of exercising thing like that, but if uh, you talk to somebody who knows, and they'll tell you, like, you know, you need to do a little warm-up period, and then work on it, and then back off, and work on it again so you don't overstrain it and everything, you know, so it's, it's important. Tendonitis or whatever. Yeah, so just keep it common sense, basically. Exactly. Okay, well, let's move on to your thoughts on applying licks and parts of uh, techniques to song. What can you tell us about 
you know, the theory behind keeping it in check so that the song comes first and the so theory... you don't overplay. Yeah, basically. Well, I, well you got the wrong guy for that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, it works. No, I mean, you yeah, keep yourself it, in check within the song context. Yeah, if you listen to Paul McCartney's playing, he's playing all over the place. Tim Bogart, uh, mm -hmm. Jeff Berlin, uh, Getty Lee plays pretty busily. But it's a matter of, again, what we talked about in... Uh, in, when I was talking about patterns and stuff, once you know the neck really well, you can move all around. If it makes musical sense, it will work. Oh. And if you know your stuff, because I've seen a lot of bass players also, which is like they're flying all over the place. And they don't, uh, where's one? But 90% of my playing is. It's in the pocket. You're aware of the pocket. You know, it's just right on trying to get mm -hmm. keep the song happening. You get your spots to do it, right. but try to um, you know to stick with what you're supposed to be doing to make the song sound like the song so i would suggest for a young player to just you know play it with a band make it work and then add the frosting later exactly now what's your concept behind the secret notes that you're often reputed to play Ooh, secret note reputer yeah well basically it's just kind of a a uh, a humorous term for uh, moving the root note around underneath what the basic root of the song, the chord you're playing. Uh, simplest example of it is um, when you're like uh, doing the famous rock change. Which is Stairway to Heaven, uh, right. Million Judas Priest, you know, the million stuff. Say so the root note is E, go up to F sharp, and then to a G. Aha. It's like substitute bass notes or other notes other than the root. Right. So instead of... Mm. So they, it works because uh, those notes are in that chord somewhere. But uh, that's, that's the simple version. We're doing, uh, now we're doing a live uh, Blame It On My Youth. I'm like a... For the, for the uh, chorus part. So... Right. I got it on the youth. I go up to the. Aha. What was that? It's a B. And I remember the first time I did it, Eric looked over me like, what was that? Do that again. Interesting you know? sound. Yeah, so it's just uh, when the. So when the guitar moves one way, you just move the other way and you kind of make it automatic. That's what, basically the idea is just a kind of a, a rock perversion of what. Bach does with moving bass lines. Exactly. If you want to get an idea what that is, just get a well-tempered clavier, which is just uh, uh, pieces by Bach with just uh, solo, piano, or uh, harpsichord, I prefer it with, because yeah. you can hear it uh, much better. And you'll hear uh, the bass line moving all over the place underneath the same melody line, and suddenly the melody line does not sound the same anymore because right. the bass line is different. It's That's the idea behind it. Redefined. Yeah. So whenever uh, we're, you know, uh, a lot of songs we're doing... Um, it's I'll in always, Merciless, too, isn't it? Yeah, in, uh, um, um, just appear for that part. Paul goes to a D-sharp chord. Goes, yeah. Right. Go. Oops, to the E. Well, I did that one night, too. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> and whenever you make a mistake, just play it again. It'll sound like you meant to do it, so... That's a good rule to keep in mind. I've done that many times. And then, then left it in the song because it actually worked after a while. So. Do you ever practice that at home too? Making mistakes? Oh, that's all I practice. Getting out of them? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I practice there, right? Well, now, in our first video, we established a core of pretty strong fundamental ideas. Let's talk about how you apply some of those ideas. Okay. Uh, I'm specifically referring to the beginning of the Had Enough song, okay. where you play an intro bass solo. Yeah. It contains a lot of your interesting techniques. When I first started seeing guys uh, doing sweep things on guitar, right? Uh, Paul Gilbert and, and people like that, Ingve and stuff, uh, doing sweep stuff, um, it was really intriguing, but I was a finger player, so it was a little difficult. A little, little difficult for me to get, you know. So I learned a couple. But for me, 
that was a little awkward, so I had to think of a way to do kind of a sweep-sounding thing right. that I could play while I'm standing up, while I'm running across the stage, while the monitors are feeding back, and you know, yeah. all the, the accompanying uh, pitfalls that occur when you're playing live. So one of the things that came up was a, was a way to, it's not a full, a, a wide band with sweep, but it has, it, it's, it's a more compact version of it, but it's for me it's way more effective. And what that is, is I take like an, an E minor kind of figure there. So what I'm doing there basically is three things. I don't, I don't know how I came up with this, but it just kind of popped in. Uh, kind of a flamenco. I like a roll. So I've got that basic, that, pl that plucking thing there. So there's your E minor. to the rasquiato technique. <laughs> Boy, if you say so, I have extra cheese maybe on that. But uh, it's a bunch of techniques all together. Just hit the wrong note. What I did is I went... You're outlining the E minor and C major yeah, sounds. because that's what the, the chords of the song is. Exactly. So you're thinking the chords of the song already in the intro to your solo. Yeah, because it kind of gives you the feel, sets it up, uh, you know, for... So it's not such a big surprise right. when the song comes Which in. is important. It should be integrated into the song, right? It shouldn't be a standalone solo that takes away from the song. Can be. In this case, it isn't. Yeah. In this case, we stick with the song. It's more structurally it can, related. Yeah, it can be structured, you know. There's, there's no real rules as far as that goes, but some people like to try and keep things as much continuity, thread of continuity, uh -huh. which is cult of personality. <laughs> so we got this thing here in uh, E minor. I could, I could resolve it by hitting the high E there, actually, but I'm hitting the D. So what I'm doing here on the C part of... Now when I'm hitting, hitting it, I'm hitting a fifth here. Right. So I'm, then, aha! Uh -huh. It's a kind of cool gun. Ending with that. two tapped fifths in a sense. Yes. So it's. So it's. Yeah, that is a combination of techniques. Yeah. So that you have uh, about three techniques in all. Now, what somebody could do with that probably from when they when they take it off this tape and use it. There's all kinds of chord patterns you can use. A right. There's all kinds of ways you can do that. So once you get that technique down, we can do that pluck. There's all kinds of variation you can do with it. There's a lot of times when I show people something, or explain something that I've played, I'll come back and see some guy like about a year later, and he's like gone way off in left field and does all kinds of things that I never even thought of. So hopefully everybody that could pick up some portion or this whole thing, you know, uh, a year from now, will, it will their become own their own, and, and you can do all kinds of stuff yeah. all, all down the neck with it. That's just, I do a couple variations on it, two of my solos, but for, for the sake of time, that's basically where it comes from. Uh, would you show us the tap-on technique you use in Addicted to That Rush? Uh, yeah, that's um, basically uh, the thing starts out with like a trill, um, with the left hand doing a trill. Probably go like about that's about like average speed. Some people do way faster, some people not as fast. Whatever, doesn't matter. But I managed to bring this one around and get it in between. So when it's going. Become just a blur of notes. Right. I stop Paul as a thing, and then we do that. Oh, wait a second. Could you slow that down sure. and, yeah. and break now that I'll, down a bit for it's, us? Because it's, it's really easy. It's, there's nothing to it, really. It's very simple. A lot of times when you see stuff go by fast, you think, oh, it's impossible, I'll never. But it's really, it's all so simple. It's almost embarrassing for me to show it because it's really, there's really nothing to it. <laughs> basically all there is to it. So you're just 
taking the same move and just kind of moving it around uh, within the framework of the key that you're in. Then, next string. Then. You almost have to be in two places at one time, though, don't you? Yeah, because a lot of what's, what passes for speed and agility is, is just basically the, the ability for one finger to get out of the way, the other one so it can do its thing. Because right. I'm never, ever going any faster than, my fingers don't move any faster than for hammering on. So when you see... A lot of notes are going by, but it's not, not a lot of movement. actual movement I'm doing is not a lot of hand movement, but it's just a coordination of the two. It's kind of a natural flow to it. And when you slow it down, take your time, and really do it slow. Strong, so all the notes are even. When you speed it up, it becomes just kind of like a, like, you know, turning on a faucet, kind of, it really kind of flow. like that. Wasn't there a phrase in Addicted to That Rush after the solo that you talked about once as far as a good one to develop strength? Yeah, um, the second one, when, when uh, Paul and I do the, the second part of it, uh, that's, that's the one, yeah. It's really hard because for guitar players, the strings are lighter, and it's a lot easier to just kind of roll off the strings, right. and a lot of a lot of sound comes up. For bass, you really gotta you gotta pull actually pull off that note there, which is kind of tough. Oops, there's that note again. It's built into it in the bass. There you go. You know that occurs to me that you're using shapes again. Exactly. Now, all the stuff I said earlier about shapes applies here. G major, which is the key we're in. And then I think, I forget what chord it goes to from there, but that's basically the... Let's go back to the chorus? That goes into the... Right. But, uh, Which reminds me, you were also known for using chords a lot. Yeah. So you just played a couple. Could you tell us a little bit about the chords? Yeah, when I'm playing style uh, you've developed. Yeah, when I'm playing live all the time, instead of just hitting a you know really hard part that's gonna hit an A note, you know, I always hit the whole the whole as many A notes as there are on the bass. Why not? Because I've always played like three piece bands, and as much noise as much sound you can get in there, go for it. So yeah. a, lot, a lot of endings, you know, instead of just a big instead of that little hit, hit the whole thing. As many notes uh, that work in, in E as possible. So um, uh, that, that helps to kind of bring a three-piece band, an extra invisible guy, along. So um, uh, for bass, as, uh, as many chords as there are on any other instrument, only you can have to work with four notes. So, uh, you know, the basic... Major, minor, suspended, and then uh, any variation thereof. But um, understand with the bass, uh, to play a chord on it, you're going to have to really uh, to stick with kind of with fifths yeah. and octave sounding things because you get into these like that's not going to work really loud with a super yeah. bass amp. It's going to shake all over the place. It's not going to really work in unless you're playing by yourself and it's quiet or something like that. So you have to always temper. The idea of using an unusual chord or something with the idea of, is it really practical, useful, and does it sound good? Right. Rather than trying to think, oh, technically it works, so I'll do, you know, it doesn't always work. And when you're out in the audience watching and you don't know anything about bass or guitar, you just hear something where, you know, somebody looks at each other and goes, this doesn't sound good. They don't know why, you know, but yeah. it's just because you have to temper that with some, a little bit of, uh, what is that, taste? Uh, something taste, like something that. like that. <laughs>
Now, how did your solo bass, so, uh, the bass solo you actually play, evolve? Well, um, we used to do a song, Mr. Big, we used to play. We did that song by Free in uh, right. Talos in the old band. And he said this real long. Though. It's just a little bass solo in between those yeah. changes. So one night I told the guys before I went on stage, it was at the Poor House uh, West in Hamburg, New York. Uh -huh. And uh, I told him before I went on stage, I said, look, when we get to the part of Mr. Big, I'll just look over and go, two, three, four, and just stop dead, and I'll just go. They'll start lay out completely, just you'll stop. just keep going. And then I'll cue you to come back in. It was like, oh, here we go. This is 1972, mm -hmm. maybe, or three. And sure enough, I stopped that and went to this, all these bass things. I did a few Bach things that I'd been working on and learned, you know, and uh, some some things that I'd worked out in other songs that I was doing behind that people that hadn't noticed yet, you know, because it was in the context of other songs. I just counted back in, two, three, four, and we ended the song, and, uh, and that was basically the first time I ever did that. And it course, went over. Yeah, it worked really good. Um, uh, Hendrix did that, I mean, with the unaccompanied solos. Sure. He's got the first guy I really heard to do heard doing unaccompanied solo, sure. so it was kind of, he laid the groundwork for it. And, uh, like Star for, Spangled Banner, things like that, you mean? Yeah, things like that, we just go wailing away and stuff like that. And then after a while, I'd like be doing, uh, you know, some of Mussorgsky's, you know. Uh -huh. You know, the... Right, pictures at an exhibition. things like that, throwing all in the uh -huh. solo thing. And it was really funny because uh, it was rare for guitarists to do it back then for yeah. the sort of bass player. People were completely, some people didn't like it at all. Hey, we can't dance with this, you know. <laughs> what, you know. They, those people eventually weeded away and right. we just drew more of another kind of people. They kind of went off band. to disco, huh? Yeah, exactly. They tore the stage down, put a mirror ball up, and that was the end of that. But um, yeah, that's just basically how it worked. Then I would just do pieces of songs and things. And now it's kind of evolved to a point where I just flail away and. Uh, I got some guidelines as to what I do, and solo is sometimes it's very much like what I used to do a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's all new. Try and try and be a little improvisational. But right now we're out touring with Rush, so in front of fifteen thousand people, you don't necessarily want to take a big chance. But it's fun if you take a little bit of a chance. You know, try something new you've never done before. You know. Does it have a structure though? Uh, yeah, I play loosely. Yeah, I play some wild stuff. I back it down. I play some quiet stuff, and I come back and do some more stuff. You know. And it, <laughs> within context, right. uh, at some point or another, there's uh, various things that I've done throughout my whole life. And every night I'll always do something that I haven't done before or I haven't tried before, some combination of things. So it's always different. The solo is always different. But it has basically uh, the context of, uh, like a lot of classical pieces, you start out with the main theme, you back off and you do a couple sub things and you come back in with a big grandiose finish. You know? yeah. So that's pretty much what, what it is. And then we go right into addictive uh, and the solo now with a little part and the pet comes in and does exactly. the drum things and we're, Paul comes in and we trade some stuff off and that's, that's, that's our story side of the truth. <laughs> Another extension of chords that you seem to use a lot is the idea in NV, that one section ah. in your NV solo where you yeah. tap chords on. Yeah, that was back in about 1983 or 82 even. Um, I don't even know where it came from. I was just kind of uh, I was doing a, holding a chord and, and doing a little trill on top of it. It's a D major chord. Mm -hmm. That all those notes there kind of worked. So yeah. uh, again, looking at the simplistic point of view that I did and still do sometimes. 
Now I dropped, I made the chord a minor, which means this, this note does not work. This has got to go. Right. So it's... That was an accidental move. When I first did that, I, I had no idea. Another accidental one. Now there's a C chord here, and I'm playing. Actually, it's a it's a G major chord over C. Yeah. See how that works? Exactly. Then a simple ascension like that. The fingering is kind of tricky. I saw when I did a, a clinic in Japan. I saw a kid. Uh, try to do that and he had the whole thing but he had these fingerings that were all like you know oh really all over the place but it's actually again a lot of times when you hear something it sounds more complicated than it really is uh, when, when people are watching me play I know I know they have a puzzled look on their face like going I'm hearing all these notes but he's not really doesn't really look like he's doing anything because yeah. I'm really not I mean it's just a way of economy of motion like we talked about last time there's more logic maybe in what you're doing than what they're expecting to hear uh, yeah. They expect it to be tricky, in other words, so they're looking for yeah. the tricky way of executing it. Right, but in actual fact, when you're playing live, you want to keep it as at least tricky for you yeah. as possible. Because you an could probably point. do some histrionics and acrobatic kind of moves there, but it, when you're, like, again, running across the stage, it right. doesn't always work. So I try to do things that really depend on strength. You can really get a really strong, hard tone on that you can, that aren't so weirdly esoteric that it's going to be difficult for you to just summon up at any given time from, from your imagination. What are some of the other key points that you like in your NB solo? Uh, there's a couple like... Now how did that develop, that, that was, idea? That um, was taken from the Van Halen. Oh, Mean Street. That, that thing there, which I, I don't want to play too much of to so <laughs> encroach upon Eddie's, uh, Eddie's uh, thing. But yeah. When I, I first saw him doing that in 1980, it was part of a solo. And later on, he put it into the intro of a song. An amazing piece of music. And it's actually, I think, from what I understand, taken from a... Yeah, kind a, of bass a kind of a slap bass figure. Because Eddie's a great bass player and a good drummer, too. It helps out his guitar playing. That's why I urge bass players to learn a little bit about guitar and definitely a lot about drums, because it helps out your playing a lot. So remember that. Remember that. So, um, so that tapping thing... Because I never did the thumb thing. I, I can't... I'm just not... I practice it once in a while, but I'm... So many other guys have it so much better than right. I do. Uh, why even bother? You know, just call, well, you call them. You probably could, but you got priorities. Yeah, I, like. I would like to because it's, it's really great. But um, so I just did a lot of tapping with this mm -hmm. finger naturally because I never even really knew about the thumb stuff when I because of the, most of the stuff I played didn't require it. Most rock bands just a way of a you're hitting on the octave. You're getting so much sound, and it looks so light, the way you're playing it. Yeah, it's kind of a touch that you get. Your finger actually kind of bounces off. A lot of guys like hold it on there too long. It's just kind of a way of bouncing your fingers, both on the right and left hand. Now, what's happening in your left hand at that point? Aha. Uh -huh. And, so this, uh, this upper note section has a pedal kind of effect. It stays put yeah, you're, you're while getting, the other notes below it change. You're kind of getting that chord there. So you got to kind of stick within the realms of what works with those three notes. Ah. So uh, It gets and, pretty elaborate. Yeah, so now anybody watching this can take that and do any kind of chord structure in the world they possibly conceive of. It should be in one key, similar key, chord yeah, changes or, related. Or, or experiment. I've never, I've, can honestly say, I've never played that pattern before in my life, before this moment here. And the open strings are a part of it, of course. Yeah, so, so you can, uh, the, the variations are limitless that you can yeah. do with it. So, um, and it originally came from, you know, that thing, and it's just going to extend it all over the neck. So there's a lot of ways you can uh, approach uh, tapping and hammering, and uh, I try to encourage people to be unlimited. Uh huh. And, and every time you come up with something, understand, like for a long time in my solos, uh, in the old days, I would always just... 
for what that is. Kind of a raking uh, yeah. half hammer technique here. Get a little really. Get a real fast thing out of it now. And you're that, barring under there too, as yeah, well. Yeah, I'm holding these notes here and, and then barring here too. So look how little motion there is yeah. for all those notes. And now, and then just uh, about a year ago, I finally realized, hey, why don't I try another chord, only the same technique? Yeah. So there's no limit to how many exactly. variations you can do. And now somebody out there that has a better grasp of chord structures than I do um, can do the same technique because you that's why you get into a spot with your hands where they do a certain thing and you do it really well a little bit of variation you can change it around so once you got a real good technique move learn how to make it more musical right where a lot of guys get this technique thing and they just do technique 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 you know all over the place we realize that um that's that's like your building block like when i first did hammer-ons and stuff like that I, I, after a while i realized oh you can why wow, you can move that around that hand and you can move this hand around too Do extra finger. And so this pretty soon, uh, you know, the whole world, everybody knows what the hammer ends are all over the place. Right. So um, the same idea with a or What about the area of string bending? You'd mentioned that briefly, but could you get a little bit more in depth about your technique, how you do it, and um, tips on? Executing? Yeah, for a bass player to bend strings, a lot of guys don't do it because the bass is a heavy, heavy strings. But uh, I, I have a custom set, and I have the uh, G string a little tiny bit lighter, just a tiny bit, uh, two thousandths of an inch, I think, is what it is. And the E string is a little heavier because the E string usually is very floppy on, a, on any given set of strings. So if uh, to bend strings, like a, I'll always uh, try to get as many fingers on that string as I can. And have them all bend, uh -huh. so so that so that it takes all the pressure. As you can see, little holes that are created. If I if I hold this now for a second here, you see little holes that are created in my fingertips. Groovy, but, yeah, very groovy. Ooh. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so um, those little groovy grooves there, um, they uh, indicate that the the um, pressure is equally distributed over all, th all three fingers. If you're just doing it with one, you'd have all that pressure pushing on one finger, which may be uncomfortable. Some guys probably can do it that have a lot stronger hands than I do. Sometimes I'll even get all four behind all there. All four, even. But, ah. but it, what I generally tend to do when, when I get behind, get behind something like that, yeah, I, I try to keep as many fingers on it, and I kind of roll my fingers down and push it up that way. Some movement's coming from the wrist, apparently, too. Uh, yeah, um, I'm actually good point because I never even realized that. I'm, it's kind of a leveraging almost. Yeah, I'm kind of, uh, kind of the vibrato part comes from that. Uh, I have these top frets scalloped out on these bases too to make, make a, like a little easier to get underneath there because on these ah. higher notes we're gonna need a lot of pressure to, to bend them up. I tend to to bend down underneath and push up. Um, so so you're, you're in the scalloped area. Yeah, for this here. It's not always necessary to do that. I just happen to do that for myself. Is it's it, a little bit more comfortable? It seemed it. You know, yeah. it, seems, it seems like it makes it because you don't hit any wood there like you would down here. Hear that wood mm -hmm. scraping up against it? Because I do a lot of high bends on the bass to try and get it with the highest note you can, can, uh, you can get out of the instrument. So um, generally the G string gets bent up. The D string is optional. <laughs> I don't do too much bending on the D string, as, uh, obviously. And then uh, the A and the E are bent down. And now the E string you can really. Boy, that is that's quite a quite a long ways. So that's it's out of tune too now. But but you can bend the E string quite a bit. So the lower strings are looser by nature, and the higher strings are tighter. So you kind of have to get underneath these and you can pull these down. 
In the last video, you mentioned a little bit about pinch harmonics, but since then you've elaborated a bit on them, like in the Blame It on My Youth break that you play, it almost sounds like a guitar. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more in depth about the way you play artificial pinch harmonics? Yeah, like uh, as I said in the last video, I guess there's no way to actually hear them now if you hear the record. A lot of it is limited. You can't really do a lot of fast picking because you got to as fast as you'll get, as I'll get anyway, somebody else probably just has it. But anywhere on the string, there's a harmonic in there. So when you're playing live, you get that real. It's like, a, you know, our, our sound man for, in, in our shows uses that to kind of judge where uh -huh. the bass becomes sometimes the second guitar for thick moves like that while Paul's playing the chords and stuff. I'm doing that. What would it sound like if you played it without the harmonics, just for contrast? And, and then with the harmonics? Yeah. Something like that. Makes it much more interesting. Yeah, because it's colorful. Uh, if you don't really need the note for a, uh, like a root or yeah, something. Yeah, to, to establish. And it's also, if you did play like that, it kind of gets some like a lot of frequencies there. So we just kind of cut out the low frequencies and just go for the real high ones. Again. So it doesn't get in the way of what the guitar is doing or what the singer is singing. Anyway. So Are you going for specific there. placement, though, when you play that? Or? I think I, I accidentally get specific placement because what I do is um, my hand's here, so when I go below this pickup, it's kind ah. of a, visualize against the pickup in relation to the pickup sometimes? Uh, it's just kind of a natural thing that my hand uh -huh. falls up because you can't do it over the pickup because then I don't have room to reach underneath and here this big pickup's in my way so we have one other option <laughs> right here so that's kind of that's where it kind of ends up natural See? selection kind of yeah that's that's great I've seen you do something that I've never seen any other bass player do and that's bend the neck while mm -hmm. you're playing it could you give us a little bit of a rundown of what you do yeah, um, I think I first got that. I'm, I'm sure a lot of other guys do it. Maybe I think I got to go up and see more bass players. There yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, I think I got it originally from uh, Pete Townsend. Because like the beginning of uh, I Won't Get Fooled Again. <laughs> see him shake his neck around a little bit live. And I think, uh -huh. God, it, it's got to work on bass, forcing guitar. You know, that's generally a rule of thumb. So uh, a lot of times when I do like a harmonic, I'll just kind of... Can bend it and actually you hit the low note. Okay, it's quite it down a, to a D. Yeah. But we got to be careful uh, how your bass is connected here. And now, what's the actual mechanics behind what's going on? A lot of it has to do with how the strap is together. That's uh -huh. why I used to stretch my strap out all the time. I'd be playing, everything would be fine, like I talked about again in the first video, not to be redundant, but um, how the, if the strap would change its size, my, uh, all the, the angles of my hand would change as the bass moved down away from me as the strap got longer. Uh -huh. The reason why the strap was getting longer is so I was doing all these. So what I'm doing is the strap goes all the way around me, connects here and here, and I'm pushing up against it, and this is the that's fulcrum. That's holding in place. Wow, that's quite a change. You can really see you can the see strings how, how go away. Far down the neck, actually. Boy, if this broke right now, that'd be. <laughs> so there's a lot, it's kind of a way to s simulate, I was gonna say stimulate, simulate the vibrato arm. Uh -huh. We used to do like, uh, like any Hendrix kind of. Uh, Get those uh -huh. There's some of that in the NV solo too. As a matter of fact, at one point you're, you hear it going crunch, crunch. It's actually the wood and the screw kind of starting to pop out of Is the bass because right? I was at the, in the heat of the moment there. I was pushing really hard on the bass. Sometimes live I'll just push as hard as I can. And uh, the only thing wrong with it though is it sometimes picks the strings up off the pick, off the, or moves them up away from the pickup so it gets, doesn't, it's not as quite as loud. Uh -huh.